you wrote the book, The Cossack Myth, History and Nationhood in the Age of Empires. It tells the story of an, an anonymous manuscript called The History of the Rus. It started being circulated in the 1820s. I, I would love it if you can tell the story of this. Um, this is supposedly one of the most impactful texts in history, modern history. So what's the importance of this text? What did it contain? How did it define the future of the region? In the first decades of the 19th century, after Napoleonic Wars, a mysterious text emerged that was attributed to an Orthodox archbishop that mm -hmm. was long dead, which was claiming that the uh, Cossacks of Ukraine were, in fact, the uh, original Rus people, and that they, they uh, had the right for a particular place, for central place in, in the Russian Empire. And it tells the history of the Cossacks. Full, it's, it's the era of romanticism, full of all sorts of drama. There are heroes, there are villains. And the text captivates the attention of uh, some key figures in the, in the Russian intellectual elite in St. Petersburg. Um, um, people uh, like... Kondraty Yerileyev, who was, was executed for his participation in 1825 uprising, uh, writes, writes uh, poetry on the basis of this text. Pushkin pays attention to it as well. And then comes along the, the key figure in Ukrainian national um, uh, revival of the uh, 19th century, uh, Ukrainian uh, national project, Taras Shevchenko, and, and reads it as well. And they all read them, it very differently. Uh, eventually, by the, by the beginning of the uh, uh, mid-20th century, some of the Russian, um, mostly nationalist writers, call this text the Quran of Ukrainian nationalism. So what is what is there? The story it's 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 very important in a sense that what the authors and that's what I claim in the book, what the authors of the text were trying to say, they were trying to say that the Cossack elite should have the same rights as the Russian nobility, and brings the long historical record to prove how cool the Cossacks were over the period of time. But in, at the beginning of the 19th century, they put this claim already, they used new, new arguments. And these arguments are about nation and nationalism. And they're saying that the Cossacks are a separate nation. And that's, that's a big, big, big claim. Uh, the Russian Empire, and this is a very, very good argument uh, in historiography, that Russian Empire grew and acquired this one-sixth of the earth by using one very specific way of integrating those lands. It integrated elites. It was making deals with the elites, whether the elites were Muslim or the elites were Roman Catholic, as the case with the Poles. They would be elites would be integrated, and the empire was based based on that estate, uh, 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 the, the the state loyalty and the state integration. But once you bring in the factor of nation and nationalism and language, then once in a sudden, the whole model of the integration of the elites, irrespective of their language, religion, and culture starts falling apart. And the Poles were the first who really uh, produced, produced this, this sort of a challenge to the Russian Empire by uprisings, two uprisings in the 19th century. And Ukrainians then followed in their uh, footsteps. So the text, the importance of the text is that it was making claim on the part of a particular estate, the Cossack officer class, which was that empire could survive. But it turned it, given the conditions of the time, into the claim for the special role uh, of uh, Cossacks as a nation, creating that this is a separate nation, a Rus, Rus nation. And that is the challenge of nationalism, that no empire really survived, and, and the Russian empire was not an exception. So that's a turning point 
when the discourse switches from loyalty based on the integration of the elites to the loyalty based on attachment to your nation, to your language, and to your culture, and to your history. So that was like the initial spark, the flame that led to nationalist movements. That was the beginning, and the beginning that was building a bridge between the existence of the Cossack state in the 17th and 18th century that was used as a foundation for the Cossack mythology, Ukrainian national mythology, went into the Ukrainian national anthem, and the new age and the new stage where the Cossacks were not there anymore, where they were professors, intellectuals, students, members of the of the uh, uh, and national and, and organizations. And it started, of course, with romantic poetry. It was started with collecting folklore, and then later goes to the to the political stage, and eventually the stage of mass politics. So, to you, even throughout the 20th century under Stalin, there was always a force within Ukraine that wants it to be independent? There were five attempts uh, for uh, Ukraine to declare its independence and to, to maintain it in the, in the 20th century. Only one succeeded in, in 1991, but there were four, four different attempts, attempts before. And you see the Ukrainian uh, national identity manifesting itself in two different, in two different ways. In the form of national communism, uh, after after the Bolshevik victory, uh, in the in uh, Bolshevik-controlled Ukraine, and in the form of radical nationalism, in the parts of Ukraine that were controlled by Poland uh, uh, and and Romania, and uh, part of that was also controlled by Czechoslovakia and, and later Hungary. So, in those parts outside of the of the Soviet Union. The, the form of the national mobilization, the key form of national mobilization, became radical nationalism. In, in um, uh, Soviet Ukraine, it was national communism that came back in the 1960s and 1970s. And then in the 1991, the, the majority of uh, the members of the Ukrainian parliament who voted for independence were members of the Communist Party. So that that spirit on, 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 on certain level never died. 